Um, okay, so I am going to jump right in. Um, so if you if you have any problems seeing things, my one concern about uh, using Zoom and keeping my video on is that I'm also sharing my screen. So at any point you can't see the thing I'm talking about, please go ahead and type that in there and I will do some uh, on the ground tech support. All right, so here's what we are here today to talk about um, Smarts Elementary. Now some of you, um, you know, may know this already, we do have a secondary curriculum for middle school and high school. Today, we're gonna to focus on elementary. If you're interested in learning about our secondary curriculum, we're doing another Welcome to Smarts webinar next Tuesday at the same time. Um, okay, so here's what I wanna share with you today. I want to talk a little bit about where this program comes from, kind of what is the paradigm, what are we trying to prove with this program. Then we're gonna dive into the curriculum itself. We're going to look at the structure of units, the structure of lesson plans, and talk about different ways of accessing and using materials. I'll highlight some other resources that you and your teachers can use as you get off the ground with SMARTS. Um, if we have time, we'll talk about different you know, places. Where is SMARTS actually being used and taught, and how is it being integrated into the day? And then, of course, there's time for questions at the end. Now, we're planning to go until 5 p.m. Eastern time. Um, so we have we should have plenty of time for questions. Uh, also, if, if we don't have too many questions, I can also share some of my favorite lessons and give you guys some great ideas that you might be able to use with your kiddos. Okay, let's go. And and don't forget, really, you know, I'm a big fan of typing your questions right away. Like if I have a question on my mind, I want to get it answered. So feel free to type it in. Even if I can't answer it immediately, maybe I'll address it as we go or we'll save it for the very end. All right, let's get started. Um, so I work for an, uh, an organization called the Research Institute for Learning and Development. So we're a nonprofit in Lexington, Massachusetts, and our mission is to use executive function strategies to empower students to be successful in school and beyond. So we work with teachers in a number of different ways to really help make that happen. So we have the SMARTS curriculum, which we are all so happy to have and use. We also do a number of conferences and workshops. We have our major two-day conference at the Harvard Graduate School of Education in March. We also have a one-day EF conference in October. It's actually next Friday. We also do one-day SMARTS uh, workshops um, throughout the year. We have another one of those on next Saturday. And we also go into schools and do training and coaching, needs assessment, etc. Um, so our work is centered around um, our fearless leader, Dr. Lynn Meltzer. Uh, Dr. Meltzer is the president of our organization. She also was an associate education at Harvard Graduate School for many years, as well as a professor at, adjunct professor at Tufts for over 30 years. Um, she's published a number of books. These are only some of them. I feel like, uh, I think she told me that she's published like 10 books or something on executive function, always with this sense that executive function should be strength-based, about building, you know, process-based problem uh, solving skills, that kind of thing. I'm a big fan of um, these books especially the green book here is that this is like my executive function bible right i keep this guy uh, right next to me at all times so if you're looking to do some reading on executive function uh, that's a great one makes a great christmas or hanukkah present too all right this is dr meltzer's paradigm of executive function right this is the point of executive function strategy instruction and this is why we want to teach a curriculum like smarts so executive function strategies do not operate in a vacuum a lot of times we get kids coming to us with ef challenges and they're already saying i hate school i can't do it i'm bad at math i can't do anything right so they have no strategy they have no self-awareness of themselves as learners they do not believe in their ability to be successful and their motivation and effort are in the toilet so we're going to use executive function strategies as a way to help students learn more about who they are as learners to improve their self-concept and increase their motivation and effort. Um, so SMARTS is actually an acronym. SMARTS stands for Strategies, Motivation, Awareness, Resilience, Talents, and Success. And that won't surprise you because you just saw that paradigm a second ago. But we're hoping in SMARTS that we can address each one of these areas through the instruction um, of our lessons. SMARTS was actually originally created um, here in our center in Lexington as a peer mentoring program. We had older students work with younger students to practice executive function strategies through like fun games and activities. Like, uh, you know, when I just moved out here, I went apple picking and the kids used planning strategies for how to plan to pick apples most effectively. Um, timing estimation strategies for how to cook a turkey, which 
who knew that young kids could cook turkeys, you know? Um, so that model was really fascinating. Really, we love that peer support. We rolled out a peer coaching and peer mentoring model in a number of schools in the Boston and Cambridge area until we decided to bring the curriculum online. The first version of the curriculum, the middle school, high school version, was launched in the fall of 2015. Um, as a, so we took out the peer mentoring component and we said, we are going to um, just coach kids on these EF strategies and we'll get the peer mentoring piece at a later date. Um, so when we talk about executive function, it's very important, and I won't spend a lot of time on this, but I really wanna make sure when we say executive function, we're all talking about the same thing. There's a lot of different definitions of executive function out there. Um, so, you know, we believe in this idea of umbrella term that encompasses all these different processes that are required to be successful when you set a goal, right? So that's why you see goal setting, the ability to set a realistic uh, aspiration, shifting, the ability to look at things in a new way, remembering, the ability to juggle information in your brain, and self-checking, the ability to monitor be your behavior and correct your mistakes. But I wanna make sure that we remember that metacognition is an essential part of that executive function, right? Um, even though it's an executive function curriculum, I really encourage you to think of this as an executive function and self-awareness curriculum. If you aren't taking the opportunity to use strategies to help students build a better understanding of to learn how to learn, to learn how they learn best, then you're not really doing executive function work that's going to build um, across the years. So whatever you do, make sure to weave metacognition into your work. All right, so that's all the kind of theoretical overview I wanna do. I will highlight some other places where you can learn more if you wanna learn more about the theory and research behind SMARTS. Um, getting into the curriculum itself. So I'm gonna give you a walkthrough here, and then I'm going to actually go into the website and do it live. Um, the curriculum is arranged into, oh my gosh, someone's gonna get mad at me. I misnumbered these, I'm very sorry about that. I'll explain it in a second and I'll show you on the website. So the curriculum is arranged into seven units, that's what I'm gonna get in trouble for, um, based on those different areas of executive function, right? So the, the one that's missing, so unit four, organizing, prioritizing, it's so big that we split it into two units. Um, unit four is organizing uh, materials and time, and unit five is organizing ideas and information. Think about note-taking, summarizing, that kind of thing. So then unit six is remembering, and unit seven is self-monitoring and self-checking. I hope that my rest of my curriculum team does not watch this because they'll get so mad at me. Um, within each unit, there are two to six lessons that go along with that executive function area, so totally comprising 30 lesson plans. And every lesson has a PowerPoint, handouts, etc which we will see. Um, I also, now let's look inside a unit. So this is the cognitive flexibility unit. So you'll see there are lessons on being flexible and shifting expectations, which is about how to uh, read and understand language flexibly. I'm wearing your shoes is a perspective taking lesson where students think about what it's like to be in someone else's shoe. Skim and scoop and purposeful highlighting are reading comprehension. And 3.5 shifting math is about thinking about math flexibly. Um, what I want to stress here is these lessons are totally modular. You don't need to teach them in any particular order. So if you're looking for a lesson on math or reading comprehension, don't think you need to teach I'm wearing your shoes first. Or if you're looking for a lesson on um, perspective taking and community building, you can go straight to I'm wearing your shoes. The, there is no defined sequence, which allows you to create a sequence that meets the needs of your students, which of course we'll help you with. Here are some of the activities that fall under those um, lessons. I think I mentioned most of those guys. So now we get into kind of the structure of a lesson. Since we're dealing with elementary kids, the idea, so our secondary lesson plans are all at least an hour. So if you wanna get elementary students to sit for an hour, you probably have to glue them to their seat, right? So we've developed the curriculum a little bit differently. Um, these are the four instructional components of a lesson, right? So we call them modules. Every lesson contains four modules, and every module takes approximately 20 minutes. So some um, elementary teachers we work with will do two modules, and that might take them 30 to 40 minutes, or they do one module each time, breaking a lesson into four separate sessions. Totally fine. I just wanna take a second and make sure we know what each of those modules is. So the activator is a way to engage students to help them understand the point. Um, 
this may surprise you, but if you tell kids you're going to teach them about organization, they might groan. Oh, I know, we're all so shocked. Um, but if we play a game first that shows them what organization can be like, remove from the context of, wow, your backpack is messy, that's going to get them thinking about, well, I like to organize this way, or oh, you can organize by color, you can organize by material. You can start the conversation in a way that's more fun, and then we can start getting into the actual instruction. So activators are all about engaging students and creating some foundational awareness. Under um, guided instruction, we show the student how to do it successfully. Um, the core of our pedagogical model is we should not expect that students can learn how to do this stuff through osmosis. We are going to show them, here is how you do it, okay? Um, then we're going to allow them to practice it independently. This does not mean we are going to give them homework. Sometimes people do that in the secondary, but I know that's probably a high bar for an elementary teacher. We're going to practice it, but we're going to let them practice it. We're going to take the same strategy they did under guided, and they're going to try it on their own and independent. And then we're going to take time for reflection, right? And remember, this is where that self-awareness comes. If we do not make time to help students think about their own thinking and their own learning, then you aren't going to be able to build the know-how that's going to carry them through into middle school, that's going to help them apply the strategy outside of the context of your classroom. Reflection is absolutely essential. Um, lesson plans themselves are nothing too radical. Um, it's a bulleted format. It's scripted, but it's not like word for word. Um, I've, our feedback was mostly positive, but they're pretty easy to follow. Um, also, I want to point out that every lesson comes with a PowerPoint. Um, PowerPoints are pretty handy for a couple different reasons. One is, I don't know if you can see it, but the lesson plan is in the presenter notes. So if you've never taught this lesson before, you can follow the presenter notes and it will look like you know what you're doing, which is always a plus when it comes to being a teacher. Um, another great part of the PowerPoints is that they're totally um, modeling the strategy. If you're doing a strategy with a lot of different, you know, where there's a highlighting strategy, say, or a strategy where they have to organize things, the PowerPoint will show it happening. So it's another way to reinforce the strategy to help students get that visual input. Um, then finally, this is totally modifiable. You can put more pictures in, you can take pictures out, you can add more examples, take examples down. This gives you a chance to really think through the instruction and kind of create the PowerPoint package that makes the most sense to you. So I do like those PowerPoints. I encourage you to use them um, to get started. The handouts themselves are pretty straightforward. Um, they're PDFs. Um, they're printed in one packet, which I'll show you later. So all the student handouts for one lesson are in one packet. So all four modules, uh, print it out, staple it, bam. Also, you know, you could take out the one you're not doing, print that out, bam, right? Um, spent to save you a little bit of time there. We actually do have a workbook. Um, it is available, well, it's ready, but it's not for sale yet, but I do have the proof right here. So we're just getting the finishing touches on um, the process for that on the website now. So it should be available for order in the next week or two. Um, so I'd say maybe the second week of November at the very latest. Well, it's mid-October, by early November at the very, very latest. Um, and that is a student workbook, so per student, for having them work through all the different lessons. So this contains all the student workbooks, which are worksheets, which I believe is about 160. So if you're looking to do a really, you know, spend a whole year on this, that could be um, a good purchase. They're very pretty as well. And we do have a few ways to um, kind of go the extra mile with this curriculum. Um, in terms of reflection, so I told you every single lesson has a reflection activity at the end, but we also love this idea of strategy shout outs. That is a time for, as a class, to just talk about strategies. Who used a strategy this week? Did you like it? Did you not like it? It gives students a chance to brag or also give you some feedback on some of those strategies. We do have strategy reflection sheets you can use for that um, process as well. I'll show you where those are in just a second. The bridge to homes, I'm, I'm still putting the last um, touches on those, but a bridge to home is basically a sheet that you can send home to the parents where the student has a chance to tell the parent about the strategy they're using and the parent has a chance to discuss the way that that executive function area relates in their own life. So how do you organize yourself, um, mom and dad? Um, how do you, you know, remember important information if you're worried you're going to forget it? And that kind of helps prevent, uh, helps prevent this gap between home and school where 
you know, a lot of executive function difficulties may occur because expectations are different at home versus in the classroom. So this bridge to home can literally help create that bridge. Um, also, it helps do a little bit of modeling. This is, you know, I'll save this for like a full workshop or whatever, but I asked my student, I asked a nine-year-old, um, how much time does your mom spend organizing every week? How much time does your mom spend organizing every week? And I don't know if he was just trying to give me a hard time, but you know what he said? Zero zero minutes. And I said, well, what about putting away all the food um, in, the, in the refrigerator? And he's like, the kitchen came that way. It was already done that way. So Bridge to Home helps start some conversations so that people really, you know, kids understand that executive function is really important for adults too. It's not just something that we're asking them to do because we want to criticize their backpack. Um, okay, so now it is time to switch over to the website. So I need to make sure that this part of the process works. All right, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, um, are you guys able to see that? Can someone just pop into the chat and let, make sure that you're looking at the website? Yes, good, thank you, Helen. Um, okay, so here is the SMARTS website, smarts-ef.org. That is where you're gonna go to access the curriculum. Um, I'm gonna go over here. Well, there's, there's great blogs. There's a really good blog writers who write really interesting blogs. But um, login is where you're gonna go to uh, access your materials. Um, sometimes people are trying to access the curriculum. Here are some ways you know that you are not logged in. Number one, if you're logged in for elementary, you shouldn't be seeing secondary grades at all. But when I go to the elementary, if I see any buttons that say bye, not logged in, right? So make sure it says access. And now I'm gonna show you that. So you put in your username and your password. You should have received a welcome email that had your username and password for you. If you're having any problems with that, reach out to us immediately and we can straighten that out for you. So now I know that I'm logged in because I don't see the secondary curriculum anymore. And when I go to a unit, I see all those beautiful access buttons. Let me point out of um, something I really like about the curriculum that I didn't actually point out before. Um, every unit has an overview video. So you see this here. So remember we said that unit three is about cognitive flexibility, thinking flexibly. Um, here is an overview video that will walk you through um, some key terms about cognitive flexibility, some best practices, some common pitfalls. So I really do like those. Um, it's a quick way to kind of give yourself a crash course. Unit one actually has four. We took Dr. Meltzer's uh, keynote talk, which is an hour if she shrinks it, and we boiled it down, we distilled it to its sheer essence. This whole thing, if you watch all four, it's like 12 minutes. So if you want a total crash course in executive function, I love those first four videos on unit one. They're also on our YouTube um, playlist, which I can show you. So let's take a look at one of those um, uh, cognitive flexibility lessons. I'm feeling like in October, I really need some of that cognitive flexibility. So remember that you don't need to teach these in any order. So I'm like, my kids, they've got a, you know, I'm, I'm trying to work on their reading skills and I'm going to, you know, do skim and scoop. Um, it's one of my favorite reading comprehension strategies. So to access the material, materials, you click on the access button. This is the lesson page where you can find all the materials associated with that lesson. You'll see a summary, learning objectives. Here's that four 20 minute modules and here's a list of all the materials. Um, when I open teacher, I can see the, all the materials the teacher needs. That includes this one pager, which has key definitions and some best practices, as well as the lesson plan itself. Um, the first page is usually, you know, what you need to do at a glance to get ready. And then we get into the directed lesson. This is where you're going to actually do the teaching. So there's module one, the activator, guided instruction, module two, independent practice, module three, and the wrap up, module four. Um, here are some directions on doing that shout out. Oh, and I totally should have mentioned extensions. Shame on me. Extensions are ways that after you taught the lesson, what am I going to do next? Um, you can, you know, identify ways to connect it to your curriculum. You can ask students to generate their own examples. You can have contests, play games, books, movies, videos. Um, for each lesson, we try to recommend, you know, three to five different ways that you could take this lesson to the next level. Um, also, you'll find in some teacher packets, if there's any materials that the teacher will direct, like let's say you're going to cut up these cards and give one to each student, you can also find that in the teacher packet. 
the student packet will have all of the worksheets that the student is going to need for that lesson. Um, now, it's worth reviewing this a little bit. I love this one. So they start off with a passage about elephants. They answer some questions. Then we teach them a strategy for summarizing. It's an excellent strategy, so easy to use. It's actually a favorite in our high school curriculum and a favorite in our elementary curriculum. Um, so I, I do love it. I, right? If you're looking to do reading strategies, I think you should definitely do it. But one thing I want to point out, in lessons with high reading demands, we have a number of worksheets to select from. Notice that the length changes and the um, lexile level will change as well. So definitely take a second and select the ones that are most applicable to your student. If you're working with students who are pre, you know, they haven't got their literacy down yet, um, there's a place uh, we can work on that. I will show that to you. Um, the Skim and Scoop PowerPoint. So I think, I'm gonna open this, but I feel like it's gonna wreck my screen share. You're not, so you probably can't see the PowerPoint right now, right? That's okay, I know how to fix that. Okay, so now you should be able to see the PowerPoint. So here it is, um, like I said, you can find the uh, teacher script down here. So here's the lesson plan. Um, also, I love, one thing that's great about Skim and Scoop is that it is very visual, right? It helps students break down a passage to find the main idea and to skim each paragraph and find the topics, okay? A really fast way of creating summaries. So I do, I wanted to show you that PowerPoint because I'm very proud of it. Um, now, let's get back to the curriculum itself. Um, and so remember, so teacher handouts, student handouts, and here's that reflection sheet. Um, so you can do the strategy shout out where every student has a chance to say, oh, I like this strategy, I don't like that strategy. I use this strategy to, on my soccer game, or I use this strategy when I was, you know, um, completing my spelling test. This is a handout you can give to students to accomplish the same thing. It's a little more individualized. If you're working one-on-one, -on -one, it can be great to do. Um, you notice that it's all check boxes, right? So we're just saying, check, check, check. Um, you know, I liked it, I didn't like it, etc. Okay. Uh, so those are all the materials that are found in one lesson. Let me show you a few other planning resources that can be helpful to you. So um, under resources, I'm gonna go up to this resources tab and you'll see planning and you'll see training videos. Let's do training videos first, just cause they're nice and easy to explain. So there's a few videos um, kind of introducing you to the curriculum itself. Here's me walking through the website, you know, kind of saying, oh, this worked, this didn't work, etc." cetera. Um, here is a webinar that Dr. Meltzer and the rest of the team did on executive function in the elementary ages. And here is a, um, a keynote that uh, Dr. Meltzer delivered at Harvard on executive function. It's a little broader, it's not only elementary, but it's an excellent, excellent way to kind of learn about the theory and research behind our program. And here's another webinar that we did on understanding and assessing executive function uh, last summer, I believe. Now under the planning, there's a lot of stuff in this planning. So kind of get your pen, you know, sharpen your pencil on this. There's a lot of different things I wanna point out to you. Up here are those four um, introductory videos for um, executive functions. Remember I said this was the Dr. Meltzer's talk boiled down to 12 minutes. There's some links to that right here. Here's another spot of that walkthrough because I know that this website is not always intuitive when you're first getting started. So I want to make sure that um, we can find it. Everything, everyone can find what they need. Um, a few of the planning documents. Let's take a look. The curriculum overview is exactly what it sounds like. It's just a four page document that lists every single lesson in the curriculum. Because since it's modular, sometimes you don't wanna to have to open all those tabs like I did. Um, this is a way to kind of look at all of the curriculum at one time. Um, the getting started packet is a little more um, involved, but I think it's very helpful. Remember, we said this curriculum is modular, which is saying, great, you can teach this in any order and any sequence you want. You can spend as much time going reviewing the less strategy as you want. So that's really wonderful once you know the curriculum as well as I do. But it takes time to create that customized scope and sequence. Now, we are happy to help you with that, and I'll show you how in a second. But this packet can also walk you through the steps. It goes over a lot of the things we're covering today, you know, where can you learn more, et cetera. 
but it helps you think about how to pick your lessons based on the time you have, based on the needs of your students and the curriculum, and based on your calendar. It reviews the most common areas that um, SMARTS Elementary is implemented, as well as you know, why you might wanna implement SMARTS in that way, and what are some important tips to keep in mind. It also um, suggests some alternative ways of sorting the lessons, right? Like if you really wanna spend a lot of time on social emotional, then you don't need to start at unit you know, 1.1 and go all the way through. Here are five lessons that really address the key social emotional outcomes related to executive function in SMARTS. Here's one on projects. Um, now, I saw someone said something about what are you supposed to do with non-readers? That's a very important point. Here in elementary ages, we cannot assume that our students are reading and we can't assume they're reading at grade level even when they're you know, in fourth, fifth, sixth grade. So these are lessons that have a very low literacy demand in the lesson itself. Um, I like it because they're still accessing strategies that they can use on their reading assignments, um, but they don't necessarily have a big reading focus. Now, the next one is strategies that are directly reading comprehension focused. I will say um, there are ways that you can do these with um, kids who are not readers quite yet, but a lot of it is doing group activities. It's a lot more on the board. It's a lot less do it together, but I do think there is some value to it. You know, Skim and Scoop is all about main ideas and details. I have seen a kindergarten teacher teach it using Skim and Scoop. You're just not handing the kids the worksheet. You're talking it over with them. Um, but like I said, I think if you're, you know, if you're interested in doing that, um, it can be done. But if you're looking for lessons that do not presume any literacy skills, you can look at those guys here. And it goes on, organizing writing, self-awareness. There's also ways of thinking about, well, what lesson makes sense at different times of year? Um, some teachers love to do unit one, those really foundational, but sometimes you wanna get straight to goal setting and organizing materials and time um, around parent conferences, report cards, standardized tests that we all love, and the end of school. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to think about your year, and they're all found in this getting started packet. And there is also the planner. When you're ready to start thinking about your calendar year, you can use this to kind of map out, okay, what are my priorities for each month? What am I gonna do? And how am I gonna get it done? Um, the last thing let me show you though. So now let's say your head is swimming. You're like, what? I gotta go through that 12 page document, etc." cetera. Um, it's not so bad, I promise, but we have this getting started survey. So here's a survey that any of our SMARTS elementary users can fill out, and it asks some of those questions. How do you feel about your you know, EF expertise? And where will you be teaching SMARTS elementary? And how old are your kiddos? And how often, how much time do you have? And what are your priorities? So then if you tell us this, we will get back to you with an email with some custom suggestions. I'm gonna go through that getting started packet for you, and I'm gonna say, here's what I recommend at least to get started. So that can take some of the oomph out of this, you know, customized modular scope and sequence. Any teacher is free to do it. Um, if I send you that email and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm still confused, I'm happy to get on the phone with you or any of our friendly members of our staff will get on the phone with you to talk you through that piece. We do not want teachers to say, this is too much for me. Executive function is all about having a goal breaking down on the steps and getting there. So that's what this survey is all about. You fill out this survey, we'll get back to you within one to two business days, and you will have some customized suggestions on how to start. For anyone who is contacting us from like a school that purchased a larger package, right? So you've got five teachers, 15 teachers, 50 teachers, um, and your teachers fill this out, not only can we get back to them with customized suggestions, but we can kind of create a map of well, what are the teachers at this school saying their priorities are and how much time? And that will help administrators kind of coordinate how this curriculum is taking root in the school. So um, there's different ways, different lenses of using this getting started approach. Um, so I see that someone's like, wait, where's that survey? I'm a fast talker, sorry about that. So under resources, under planning, you can find um, this survey the Getting Started with Smarts Elementary Survey, exclamation point. Um, also, all of you should be receiving the user newsletter. We send out a newsletter to our teachers um, at least once a month, and we always link to this survey in there because we really want to make sure that you guys are feeling supported. Um, okay, so 
uh, those are the resources I wanted to share. Uh, we will be adding some elementary videos, by the way, as we go. Like this, this uh, talk that we're doing right now, I'll probably throw up there. Um, if we do another webinar that's relevant, we'll throw it up there. So also keep your eye on here. I wanna really beef up these elementary resources. Um, okay, a few other things to talk about. Let me just talk about where SMARTS is implemented. So I'm gonna switch back to my PowerPoint for a second. Now, most of you may be uh, coming to me with already knowing where you wanna do this, but I think it's interesting. Um, so I'm just gonna do it quickly and then we'll get to questions and my favorite. Um, someone said that's supposed to be me. I don't really have, my beard isn't quite that full, but wouldn't it be nice to have a cartoon version of yourself? Um, so there's three most common places that executive function seems to live within a school, and SMARTS really can fit in either one of those. The most common is we're gonna bring it into special education or any context where we're trying to build our students' skills. So sometimes your students are identified to be at risk of school failure for other reasons besides special ed um, determination, but um, SMARTS can really help build executive function strategy use in students who we know are at risk to struggle. Oftentimes we're doing it one-on-one -on -one here, we're really targeting those um, kids and we're, we're the people delivering the content may not be um, actual content teachers. They might be pulling kids out, doing one-on-one -on -one or small group instruction. Um, in that context, I think the important thing to remember is twofold. One is let's make sure that we tailor the lessons to where our kids are at. And I don't only mean focusing on what they're quote unquote bad at. I, I wanna say like, listen, you love art, Great, let's talk about how we can use cartoons to remember important information on tests, right? Um, and also, I know that you know we really have trouble keeping track of our materials, so we'll also do this material. So um, picking lessons that help them, uh, help identify the specific needs of those individual students. And secondly, making sure that we help them see the connection between their time with us outside of the class, their mainstream classroom, and going back into the classroom. So that could mean getting some assignments from, you know, they're reading their science, their math, and doing them in the context of the lesson. It could mean, you know, actually going into the class and doing a five minute refresher or working with the student, um, giving their, you know, mainstream teacher a couple of the handouts so that they can hand it to the kid when they're doing the work in class, right? So we want to make sure that we build those bridges from the, you know, one-on-one -on -one or the push out um, to the mainstream class. Um, now, uh, this is a little different. So now we're saying the context with the high executive function demand. So for example, we work um, with this organization within the Boston Public Schools, and they're having nine-year-olds do capstone projects. So nine-year-olds are doing project-based learning. Well, I know when I say project-based learning, some of you are getting the chills, right? Project-based learning can go off the rails so fast. And I believe that executive function is a big part of that. So weaving these lessons into the project is a way to teach executive function strategies and make sure that the project is more successful. So when I talk about the scope of the project, I'm gonna do some time estimation and planning lessons so that my kids can understand how I'm structuring this for them. Um, when I talk about reading and taking notes, I'm gonna do a lesson on note taking, or I'm gonna do a lesson on organizing information so that students can categorize information and summarize their findings, right? Um, I'm gonna do lessons on error analysis and learning from your mistakes so that students can revise their project. So project-based learning is a common one. Um, transition years, getting ready for sixth grade, um, you know, standardized tests, you know, getting ready for state assessments. So using strategies for reading comprehension, strategies for understanding word problems. So then they're gonna take those, you know, MCAS, I know they're called different things in different states, but they're gonna be ready for those because we're teaching the executive function strategies. Now this could be delivered by a special ed teacher or someone who's in the support role, or it could be delivered by the mainstream content teacher and or both working together, very common to see um, teams on a project like this. Um, so the need for building those bridges is still there, but it's a little bit easier. It's a lot easier to say, okay, apply this now. Um, definitely be watch out for the differentiation piece. Some kids will get these a lot faster than others. So we're gonna make sure there's time for that support, um, cycling back, et cetera. And then finally the, finally, the structures and systems of the school. So this one's a big one to get into um, you know, in, a, in a welcome webinar, but we have seen schools who say, you know what, we want every third grader to have certain ex executive function capacities. 
Um, and then we want every fifth grader to have a more advanced version and then sixth grader and then ninth grader, right? So we love that approach because that takes executive function out of this place of, well, we need it for our kids who are struggling to all our kids need this, they're all gonna need to be successful. So SMARTS is useful in that way because instead of saying, hey, you, you all need to teach goal setting, we're saying, we're all gonna teach can-do goals. And third grade, we're gonna do it this way, and fifth grade, we're gonna do it that way. So this is probably a little more than we need to get into in a welcome webinar, but just be aware that I believe the most powerful way to transform um, your student's executive function abilities is to weave it into the systems and structures of their um, daily and yearly lives. All right, so um, now it's time for questions and some of my favorite lessons. So let me just make sure I answer the questions that came. I'm gonna go back to the website because I feel like this is our best spot. Um, so let me make sure I'm sharing the right thing, great. All right, so let me just scoop up. So I do see someone asked about the, um, which lessons for which grades. So Skim and Scoop is hard for non-readers. So I, I did address the Skim and Scoop and the literacy demands one, but that sec there's a second question in there is which lessons are best for which grades? Now, it's a hard one for me to answer specifically. Um, I sometimes get that question a lot of, well, what should a six-year-old be able to do with executive function? What should a nine-year-old be able to do? What should an 11-year-old, 12-year-old, 15 or 16-year-old? How about a 30-something-year-old? Um, there is no one definitive answer. The, the official answer is a student should be able to do what the, they should be able to do what's expected of them as long as they're receiving reasonable support. Okay, so a student should be able to organize their papers as long as they've been taught how to organize their papers and they understand the system for organizing papers. So it's a little bit of a cop-out answer, but what I will also say is that's a conversation that we can have. What, I, what we do in some of our workshops is think about what some of those EF challenges you're seeing are and think about how are you teaching and supporting the strategies there. And if you're not, then no offense, but, well, the system is creating the executive function pr problem, right? If there is no support, there is no strategy behind it, and kids are struggling, it's because we haven't taught them. Now, if you're teaching it and the student is really struggling, then we say, okay, this student might need more targeted strategy instruction. They need to, let's do some strategy reflection, see what parts are they liking, what parts are they not liking. Let's try a different format, etc. So, in summary, um, to determine what lessons to do at what grade, we should think about what are the demands being put on the student at that grade and which strategies are in that sweet spot of they could do it if we had support there. Hopefully that answered that question. Does anyone have any other burning questions before we get into some of my favorites? Doing that teacher pause. Okay, cool. So let me spend some time um, highlighting some of my favorite lessons from this curriculum. Now, so this curriculum is new to the world um, as of like August 15th, but last year we did pilot it with 10 schools around the country. So I have a fair amount of kind of feedback from, um, oh, someone asked a great question. Um, well, I'll answer that now. I do have some great feedback from 10, you know, from teachers and public, private, charter, um, down to first, second, a first, second grade classroom up to probably a sixth grade classroom. So I've got a lot of feedback um, to fall back on. So this no official scope and sequence, how do you avoid teachers repeating lessons? That's a really great question also. So some um, schools, you know, what you want to kind of do. Remember we talked about how you're like creating those systems within the school. So what I usually recommend is thinking about, okay, so what, you know, some things you can repeat them every year, no problem. And you can repeat them even multiple times a year. I'm talking about goal setting. I'm talking about organizing your materials, even, you know, some of the time estimation ones, some of the error analysis, uh, social emotional things, a lot of those can naturally, um, they're, they naturally kind of fit with the scope of the year. Because think about goal setting. There's nothing wrong with setting a new goal at the start of the year. There's nothing wrong with setting another goal after the year is half over. But for the other lessons, let's say like the what is note taking or some of the reading comprehension or, um, you know, maybe like, yeah, some of the remembering strategies, although those are pretty fun. Um, 
you know, what I would suggest there is letting certain grades own them. So if there's going to be a big, like, remember that third grade uh, capstone project? I would love to teach note taking in that grade. So I'm going to tell my second grade teachers, don't you dare teach that because the third grade teachers own it. It's part of the capstone. Whereas the fourth grade teachers, I'm going to say, guess what? All those third graders have learned it. So they can still use the handout because now we're saying, oh, remember this three column note taking format? And, you know, I mean, some kids will be like, yeah, some kids will be like, no. So you might show them a model, but theoretically they've received the full lesson. They do not do the full lesson again. So once again, in summary, some lessons are great across grades. They're part of the kind of core values of the school. We're going to do them again and again. Some of them we assign to different grades based on the special demands that are being put on those students in that grade. Okay. Um, great. So um, let's take a look at a few of our favorites. So unit one, the unit one lessons are all about, you know, foundational stuff. So you know, you know, lesson one, what is metacognition? Lesson two, we're teaching kids what executive function is. Lesson three, cognitive flexibility. And lesson four, strategies. And honestly, I, it's hard for me because you know what, you're gonna hear me say this a lot. I love all the lessons. They're like my children, I love them all equally. Let me just show you some of the activities in here that I think are great. Um, so for 1.1, this how do I think about my thinking, we do this really great idea. We call this a then, right? We really wanna to get to that um, growth mindset. Everyone has strengths and challenges. So, and I'll remember this, is, this one here is the activator. So I'm not gonna say, hey, you, tell me what you're bad at. I'm gonna say, let's talk about a character. Could be fictional, could be uh, a sports or movie star, a movie, you know, some a character you saw in a movie, could be a book that we read recently, could be the teacher, could be the principal. Um, what are their strengths and challenges? And then we have them go on and do it for themselves. Um, and we have a word bank here. This is for students, you know, with that, there's that kind of reading expectation. We also have um, under the teacher one, there's some cutouts that they can do um, where they can glue them, you know, for students who aren't, you know, can't read Organizing My Belongings, they can cut out a picture of a kid organizing and think about those strengths and challenges. This is a great way to really create this expectation that you are involved in this. I need you to tell me, what are you good at? What's hard for you? I see Helen did this lesson today. I hope that you enjoyed it. Um, I have a, there's some really great extensions on this one, like, uh, guess who? Um, you take the students know yourself, you shuffle it up, and you read just the strengths. So I'm gonna say, I'm gonna read the strengths. Guess who this is? This person is good at working hard, music, paying attention, and being a friend, right? It really frames this idea of we have strengths and we celebrate them. I also, the person who did the first, second um, grade in the pilot, they made a strength wall. Every kid had to draw a picture of one strength. They put them all up on the wall and that helped create this sense that we are a community with strengths and challenges. Um, here in the teacher packet, you can see those icons of yeah, so, oh, oh my goodness, that is the wrong version of it. I have to fix that. Right there. Okay. Um, a few of my other favorites. Um, the only other one I want to show in unit one will be how do I manage my work is teaching kids what executive function is. I'll be honest, when I first was doing this and I started off doing this with middle school, high school, I was like, they are never going to want to hear the word executive function. It's too scientific sounding. But the truth is, if you teach them what it is, they love it. And you know you're in trouble when they start using it on you. They'll be like, oh, Mr. Greshler, you're not being very cognitively flexible. I'm like, oh, great, good point. Um, so I do love that. Um, this one is pretty good. It had, my favorite activity in this is called the, um, it's called Matt's story. And it's a hypothetical thing where they have to, so you read this story about this kid named Matt, and he is going to do this big project. And for every uh, thing, so, you know, he's stuck on his topic. What should he do? Should he A, make a list? B, pick an animal he's, he's seen? Or C, look at books? And as the student goes through, they have to kind of mark which ones they picked on A, B, or C. You can do stickers, you can have them move to different sides of the room, and it basically identifies their favorite area of executive function. And you say, guess what? You did A's, 
you are organization. That's your favorite area versus remembering versus self-checking. Once again, framing executive function as a positive as something they already do. Tell me all the ways that you keep your desk organized or your videos or your games. Um, and we create a list of strategies that kids already use. This makes a great Bolton board. Um, you put up the strategy kids are already using. You've got a strategy wall that frames the strategies that um, they're already using and you can add to it throughout the year. Um, going into unit two, I love can do goals. So it's so funny because, you know, we're the SMARTS program, but we did not invent SMART goals, so we can't use it. But honestly, we can-do goals are better than SMART goals because can-do goals, let me see, um, can-do goals, so we spend some time teaching a student what a goal even is. You're like, what's your goal? And they'd be like, pizza, I don't know. So we gotta be like, a goal is an aspiration, a goal is something you want. We have this sorting activity where they sort long-term and short-term goals. So we wanna break them of that habit of, I wanna be famous, I wanna be a rock star. That's great, I hope, I hope at least one of my students is famous at some point. But I also want them to set goals for reading, goals for you know science. So can-do goal is a goal that is clear, appropriate, numerical, doable and obstacles considered. So the reason it's better than SMART goals is you break down the steps, that's doable, and obstacles. You think about what could go wrong. Now, this is definitely not a lesson for five or six-year-olds. This idea of measurable, doable obstacle considers is a little abstract. Um, we recommend that you actually start off by doing, you know, the guided instruction as a class goal. Let's do our can-do goal for our classroom. The classic one to do, by the way, is let's do a goal for cleaning up the class, which works very well. Um, and then we have them do can-do goals. Um, kids' goals are like, I want to drink more water. I want to finish my reading book in time, right? But getting them into that access, um, ability for goal setting is really powerful. It's a great thing to go back and reflect on. Love, love, love um, my can-do goals. Under unit three, um, we have a few great ones there. I'm wearing your shoes is a great perspective taking lesson. Once again, it really gets that social emotional piece of different people have different thoughts, different people have different lives and exploring how that can create conflict and how we can solve conflict if we understand that. Um, the activator for this is pretty great. Oh, well, this is just a story. Um, of a, a friend who disappointed another friend because they didn't understand their perspective. But you do this shoe picture, you, then you pair them, they trace each other's shoes and color them in. There are some very beautiful shoe artists out there and then interview each other. So this is another great community building lesson and it really gets to that point of um, what do we know about each other? And then we talk about how can we um, and use this to understand each other when we get angry, right? So I love that cognitive flexibility. I love that shifting in this one. Skim and Scoop, I kind of showed you. It's a um, purposeful highlight, or it's a summarizing strategy. It's great for reading nonfiction text. Purposeful highlighting is our other reading comprehension strategy. Um, it's really nice because it helps students understand how to use highlighters because students do not know how to use highlighters in a way that helps them think about how to sequence what they're reading, how to read with a perspective. This activity, Fun With Directions, the activator, I'll warn you. So this is one of those tricks. I think we've all fallen for this at one point in our life. Read all the directions before you begin. Put your name and last name, put your date, turn the paper over, draw a star. If they read all the way down, it says only do the first and second directions. So some kids do this and the whole class is like dying of laughter because they all got tricked. One class, the whole class started crying. So think about how resilient your kids are. You might do it as a group activity and all get tricked together if you're worried about that because we do not want to make kids cry, even if it's for educational purposes. Um, then you use different highlighting techniques to break down directions, whether it's a reading response prompt, a recipe for serving um, spaghetti, or a morning routine or writing a paragraph. And then we take it one step further and think about reading comprehension. We've got this passage about grandma. You read the passage, you highlight all the things about grandma's house that would make it super fun to visit for a sleepover. Then you read it again as if you're a handyman. How does a handyman look at grandma's house differently? Um, I've done this passage honestly with like 14 or 15 year olds. It goes very well. I love purposeful highlighting. Kids love highlighters. You might as well teach them how to use them correctly. My goodness, I told you these are all my favorites. I'm totally gonna run out of time. Um, unit four is our organizing materials and time. Organizing materials is for one, um, the four C's. The backpack relay race, super fun activity. 
I mean, you may not believe me, but organizing materials is our most popular lesson, which is hilarious because kids say they hate organization. By the way, why do they say that? It's two things. Number one, they have no idea that adults organize everything all the time. Remember I told you that that one kid said his parent and mom did zero minutes of, of organizing each week? That's what they think of their teachers, zero minutes of organization. They have no idea that organizing is a secret weapon that all adults have. And also, the only time they hear the word organizing is when we're yelling at them yelling you know why are you so messy oh that looks terrible you're so disorganized they have no idea what organization means and how powerful it can be so um, the activities in this are great we have a junk drawer where student needs well you provide the junk drawer but students organize just random stuff in the categories practice organization and then we have the backpack relay race backpack relay race says um, how you know they can organize um, a random so we actually let's see how can I show you this in a quick way so yeah, talking through different organizational systems, going through the four C's. Oh, wait, it must be in the teacher. Right. Um, for the backpack relay race, we have this sense of, yes. So giving them model backpacks for them to organize and then kind of race back and forth to find it versus a student-generated backpack relay race. How fast can they find the things in their backpack if um, you say, where's your math homework? How fast can they find it? Uh, where is your pen? How fast can they find it? And by doing that, it takes it makes organization a little more fun because it's competitive. Um, it's also a really easy one to circle back to when you have 10 minutes on a Friday, time for a backpack relay race. And kids will be begging, oh, do I have time to clean out my backpack before we start? And you're like, oh, I guess you can clean out your backpack. I'm telling you, a really great one. Um, the rest of these are time management. I love estimating time, got a really fun game in it. Actually, a lot of these have, both of these guys have some games. Planning production time, great when you want kids to plan a weekend. In unit five, this is organizing ideas and information. Um, Bowtech is a great one for organizing, um, out, you know, organizing your thoughts into an argument. Uh, teaching kids how to take notes is wonderful. Summarizing stories is another really popular one from the elementary pilot. And that is basically a way to uh, think about, you know, what's happening here? Who, what, where, when, why? How can I create a summary of that story? A lot of fun. Kids go crazy with it. They can also summarize their own stories. It's a great kind of precursor to outlining essays. Um, now be careful, we have a lot of samples. So you probably don't want to do all these with all your kids. You might just want to kind of hand them out um, based on, you know, groups or something like that, but very popular. Um, in unit six, those are our memory lessons. Um, a lot of mnemonics, teaching kids how to use mnemonics. You know, writing these, we were, we were dying. We thought this was so funny. And honestly, we uh, heard feedback from the kids that everyone thought it was funny. So I love these. Uh, I definitely encourage you to check those out, um, working them into preparing for small tests, but also just teaching kids, how can we learn to memorize things? And the last one is unit six. That's our self-monitoring and self-checking. We have some really good ones here. So don't think of it, you know, it's a lot of times the last unit. We don't have time for it. I love it. Um, lesson one is all about teaching kids what it means to focus and what it means to be distracted. A lot of kids have no clue. It's just like organizing. The only time they hear it, then we're saying, focus, we need to focus. They don't necessarily know what focus means. Focus does not mean you're a laser beam. No one's a laser beam. It means creating an environment where you can come back to your work easily. So what are the things that help you focus? What are the things that make you distracted? It's amazing to hear a nine-year-old say, well, this helps me focus and that distracts me. So great. Um, top three hits is one of my all-time favorites in both the secondary and elementary. It's an error analysis strategy. It helps students think about what kind of mistakes did I make and why did I make them? They practice correcting other kids' mistakes and then they can work on their own. Uh, manage my mood is emotional regulation. Think about um, your emotions and how they affect your behavior. And what hat am I wearing is self-monitoring. Am I using my inside voice right now? Am I behaving the way a student should behave? So I told myself I'd only pick like four lessons and talk you through those, but I just love them all so much. Um, so I'm going to kind of summarize and wrap up and let us all go. I got a student who's dying to come in. Um, I encourage you all to explore the resources under the planning page. Take a look at the overview, the getting started guide and fill out that survey and be in touch with your plans as you go forward. You know, we really, this is a powerful curriculum 
but it's very hard to find time for EF during the day. Sometimes it's very hard to know where to get started. If you're thinking across multiple grades, it can really overwhelm your own executive function. So please be in touch. I'm gonna go back to that PowerPoint one more time because it has my email. Although well, the truth is that my email is all over that website, so it's hard not to email me. But um, this is how you can get a hold of me. Um, and you reach out with your questions, reach out with your concerns. We really hope to hear that this has been an amazing year for you and your students, filled with all sorts of great executive function victories. So um, with that, I'm gonna sign off. Thank you, hope you guys have a great rest of your Thursday, and I'm looking forward to an amazing weekend, and hope to hear from you in the future.